so we can see how well. Um, the slides work for this. Um, so now uh, that we've sort of covered sort of a brief, brief introduction into <coughs> the uh, you know, model-based approach and applying that to a few kind of simple toy problems and you know, seeing where that has issues, like with the, the breast imaging where you can't really tell the difference between how thick it is and what the absorption coefficient is, um, we'll go into kind of the more machine learning approach. And so um, I call this the machine learning approach, but this isn't actually going to involve machine learning at this point. It's about using the sort of statistical techniques that they have for measuring how well we're doing on a problem. And so for what we'll look at with this is, oops, I guess that's already not working. Is this problem of um, electron microscopy and finding um, I think mitochondria in the images. And so we have this image here. Oh, that says road lines. So now we have this image, which is what we get from a microscope, and then this, this map on the right side with mitochondria that we're trying to find. And so if we kind of reference back to the second lecture, um, you know, this is where data sets and ground truth become quite important. And so rather than sort of going through this image and tweaking the threshold value until it kind of looked good, you know, the job we have is to take this image and to manually go through it with a paintbrush and mark everything that's a mitochondria in that image based on our expert understanding of what's inside this image. And so, you know, looks like it's, you know, the bright things, but there's a certain texture and a certain pattern. And if you're used to looking at these images, I guess it's not that difficult to manually paint all of those things in. And so we end up with these sort of paired images. And so ideally, we've done this now for a number of samples, but here we'll just show one, where we have the image and we have where the mitochondria are. And so now what we want to do is kind of identify which class each pixel belongs to. And so we want to be able to take a pixel and decide, is it part of the mitochondria or is it outside of the mitochondria? I'll change the example, as you can tell. Um, because the street lines example was very bad looking. If you're interested, you can go to last year's lecture, but this one I think looks much nicer. But basically, if it's in a mitochondria, we label it as foreground, and if it's outside a mitochondria, it's background. And so this <coughs> falls into the sort of problem class we talked about before. And this is where, you know, how can we quantify this? And so what we have, which I guess many of you have probably heard of before, are these sort of measurements, you know, true positive, true negative, false positive, and false negative. And so what we see is that, you know, a true positive value is a value where we predict that it's inside the mitochondria, or sort of, it's inside the mitochondria, and we classify it, or we make a prediction that it's foreground. True negative is where it's outside the mitochondria, and we classify it as background. So basically, the true ones are the ones we've identified correctly, the false positive are values that are outside the mitochondria that are classified as foreground. And the false negatives are values that are in the mitochondria that are classified as background. We can then apply a threshold to the image to determine the number of points in each category. And so for each threshold we apply, we're able to calculate how many true positives are there, how many true negatives, how many false positives, and how many false negatives. And so here, we pick a very simple threshold of 0 0.5. And that we can see, this is the image, this is our threshold. Oh, road lines again. And so that we have what we're trying to do and what we actually predict. And so we can go back and change this value to you know, 0.6. 
and see that we now get off. We lose some of those, so maybe 0.55. It's a little bit better. But probably 0.5 is about what we'll need to have to get, you know, that looks like the best value we're going to get. And so now what we can do is we can go through each pixel in our image and basically say, you know, is it a true positive, is it a false negative? And then sort of visualize that as these are all the true negatives we have. So this is where we said it was outside of the mitochondria and it was in fact. These are the false positives. So these are the things that we thought were inside the mitochondria and in fact they weren't given the threshold. True positives were the things that we then sort of guessed correctly. So we said it was inside and it was in fact inside. And the false negatives are sort of the points that were supposed to be inside mitochondria that weren't. And so that, you know, these metrics, which is why we had the initial link um, in the first set of slides, are applicable to lots of things. And so probably the usual place you've heard about true negative and false positive are sort of with like medical exams, where, you know, you go to the doctor and they, you know, say you have a positive on a test, um, you know, like a blood test or a diabetes test or something along those lines. And, you know, there's a certain amount of chance that that's a true positive, but there's also a fairly large likelihood that it's a false positive. And similarly, if you get a negative, you know, it could be a true negative, but could also be a false negative. And so these are the metrics that are often kept track of for those kinds of problems because it's very useful for quantifying what are these different probabilities and what are we actually trying to maximize in our system. And so with images, it's nice because it's quite visual so that you can look, you know, at the false negatives. What are we missing in our system? And is this actually anything important? You know, we already found this mitochondria, so missing a few points inside it might not be that big of a deal. But if we're trying to measure the area of the mitochondria, having points in the middle missing would give us an inaccurate representation of the area. And so based on what we're trying to do would change how important these true positives and false positives are. So now what we can do is we can apply sort of other metrics to it. So we can use recall and precision. And so what this allows us is rather than just counting the number of true positives, it lets us sort of normalize it a little bit better. And so that, you know, we have recall, which is true positives over true positives plus false negatives and precision, which is true positives over true positives plus false positives. And so if you're interested in these, um, so there's quite a few different definitions for this. And so you can easily look online. Wikipedia has a quite nice article for this where you can see sort of what you're comparing in your different charts. And so here you have sort of the full table of things that you can calculate where you sort of have true positives, false positives, false negatives, true negatives, type one error, type two error, power, so all of these different terms for kind of the same thing. And all of these different values, you know, prevalence, positive predictive power, false discovery rate, accuracy, negative predictive value, diagnostic odds ratio, F1 score, specificity, and all of those other things combined. And so that we kind of focus on these two simple metrics, so precision and recall, of true positive over true positive plus false negative and true positive over true positive plus false negative. So false positive here and then false negative here is the only real difference between those two. <clears throat> and so what we can show is we can calculate what the recall and precision are and so that we can see that we you know find most of the things that we're supposed to find but that this low precision value means that we find a lot of stuff that we weren't supposed to. And so recall says kind of how good were you at finding what you were hoping to, and precision is kind of how accurate of the stuff you found were you. And so this then leads us quite directly to this idea of an ROC curve, which is what I mentioned at the very beginning, and that was sort of the receiver operating characteristic. 
and it first came with um, sort of World War II soldiers using radar in battlefields to detect, you know, planes and other flying objects. And as you can imagine, just like these images here, you sort of had this very, very noisy input from the initial radar systems. You know, you had very old electronics, you had very bad amplification circuits, you had lots of other disturbances. And so you would get a very noisy image, and your goal was to take this image and decide if that's an airplane or if that's not an airplane. And then, of course, deciding if it's an enemy airplane or if it's a friendly airplane or if it's just a cargo flight or something else. You know, a bomber, obviously, you treat differently. But just in the very simple problem of you're trying to look at, is it an airplane or not? And there, you know, you might have a threshold value for your radar signal but you want to be able to optimize this threshold value. So at what point does a signal become serious enough that you consider it to be sort of a likely positive? And how do you evaluate how well your method works? And, you know, in a war situation, you actually have a fairly clear, you know, a false positive means, you know, you get all your troops moving, you start firing flak, you waste precious ammunition, and, you know, maybe there was not an enemy play, um, pilot nearby and a false negative, you know, you could get attacked and you're completely unprepared. And so what the ROC curve let them do was sort of plot for each threshold or for each kind of cutoff criteria for the radar signal, what was sort of the relationship between precision and recall. And so that you can kind of make this curve where you kind of tune it over a number of different threshold values and you see how your precision and recall values change. And so you can kind of update this to the easier version of ROC, where we just look at true positive rate and false positive rate. And this is then sort of a much nicer curve to look at. And so here we have the rate of true positives, and here we have the rate of false positives. And our ideal position is then in the sort of upper left corner, because that means we have 100% true positives and 0% false positives. And this curve then shows us as we adjust the threshold value, how do the true positive rate and false positive rate change? And so we're clearly quite far away from it, but depending on what we're trying to optimize, we can choose a different position. And so, you know, if you were really trying to avoid um, false negatives, or if you really wanted to make sure you have the highest true positive, positive rate possible, you'd probably choose something up, you know, maybe all the way up here, because then you'd be sure that you would catch all the events that came, but you'd have the problem that you would catch a lot of events, you know, you'd basically just be throwing an alarm all the time. And so if you come down to this point, you know, that's probably a reasonable trade-off if you're really sure you don't want to miss anything. Whereas if you had another criteria where, you know, false positives are very expensive, they're demotivating, then you might choose a point sort of closer to here where you have a better trade-off between those two. And so basically what this curve shows you is kind of that balance between those two factors. And so for each threshold or each cutoff or each parameter that you pick, you get a point on this curve. And so with our images, this corresponds to kind of the intensity of the threshold. And then we see here on the sort of last part, it's a bit smaller, I guess, is we have this green line. And this green line in our problem sort of refers to random guessing. And so this is kind of the worst you would expect <coughs> to do. And so if you're doing worse than random guessing, you have a really terrible model. And so that's kind of the, you know, the point where your true positive rate and false positive rate, you know, if you're always saying, you know, here you're always saying it's um, negative, so you're never saying it's part of a mitochondria, and here you're saying it's always part of a mitochondria. And any point in between is just saying sort of some split between that, but really not adding any information to your system. Um, and so if you had a curve that was going down here at this very bottom part, what would that say about your model? 
<laughs> it's inverted. Yeah. So basically, having a model below this curve is a really bad model. But if you just flip the model over, so if you just do the opposite of whatever your model says, so when it says it's in a cell, you just say it's in the background, then you end up with a really good model. So you actually can't realistically ever do worse than random guessing, because if you do worse than random guessing, then you just flip what the output is, and then you'll hopefully do better. Um, but that's also what's very nice about using sort of algorithmic approaches is that you have these parameters that you can tune and so you can decide how to make an exchange for yourself between crude positive rate and false positive rate. That, you know, if you go to a doctor and they do an exam on you and they say, you know, you might have uh, you know, colon cancer, your doctor operates at some point along this curve and that's where they are. And if they're reproducible, then they're always in the same spot. But you can't tune your doctor to tell them which point along this curve you want to operate. Whereas an algorithm, you can always take the information you have and decide, you know, for you or combined with other information, which point makes the most sense for them to make the diagnosis at. And so you have this sort of flexibility or tunability to choose different points in your output. Um, for us, with image processing, what's quite nice is that we can now take all of these methods, or a few of these methods that we covered last week, so like Gaussian and median filters. Um, did he cover difference of Gaussian? So difference of Gaussian is um, quite a nice filter because it basically just takes a Gaussian with one sigma and subtracts a Gaussian with another sigma. So can anyone think of why this would be useful? You know, is taking a sig Gaussian with sigma 1 minus a Gaussian of sigma 3 the same as taking Gaussian of sigma 2? Or is it doing something different? Yeah, so it's an edge enhancement filter? Yeah, something like that. Yeah, and why would it be a good edge enhancement filter? Or when would it be a good edge enhancement filter? Any ideas? <laughs> when you have background noise? Exactly. So if you do an edge enhancement and filter when you have background noise, you end up making the noise very, very intense. Right. And if you do a difference of Gaussians, you sort of filter the image with one. So here, basically what we do is we filter the image with a small kernel, and then we filter it with a larger kernel. And so what we focus on are the structures that are sort of between those kernels. And so by taking sort of a you know, Gaussian filter with sigma 1 and a Gaussian filter of sigma 3. A Gaussian filter with sigma 1 kind of gets rid of most of the noise but keeps the bigger objects. And a Gaussian filter with sigma 3 kind of blurs out the background much more. And so what this will help us focus on are objects that are sort of between, you know, bigger than sigma 1 but smaller than sigma 3. And so it lets us make sort of an edge enhancement with a tunable parameter on what edges we're sensitive to and the ability to repress a lot of the noise that we don't want to see. And so, yeah, exactly. It works to help us kind of enhance what we're interested in looking at. And so here, if we take this original image, this was an image with no filter. This is a Gaussian filter. This is sort of a difference of Gaussian filter. And so the noise doesn't get amplified too much, but the boundaries of these cells stay quite strong. And then the last one is sort of the, the median filter. And so what we can now do with our sort of ROC curve approach 
is we can make curves for each one of these different filters. So that we take the image that comes out of it and we tune the threshold between sort of zero and one or whatever the range of the values is. And we can now make a curve. And so that we see, you know, this is our ideal. It stays in the same point. Random guessing also stays in the same point. And we have sort of our blue, which is our original image, and our red and our orange. And so what do these curves tell us, or what conclusion would you draw from this? Would you use difference of Gaussians for this problem? <clears throat> And which one would you use? Yeah. 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 Right. And so what's quite nice about this technique is that this lets us take all that image enhancement stuff that we did and put it in a nice framework where we say our goal is to get to this upper left-hand corner. And so uh, what we can actually do is just measure the area under this curve. And that'll tell us, you know, if it's here, the area under the curve is very high, you know, 1.0, if it's exactly at that ideal operating point. And if it's here, the area under the curve is 0.5. And if it's all the way down here, then it's zero. And so that gives us sort of an easy way of comparing how well has this image enhancement step handled our data, and has it given us something that's easier to process or not? Um, so there's clearly cases where difference of Gaussians would come in very useful. Uh, this image wasn't a great example of that, but you could also change the filters or tweak the filters and change the kernels to try to see which ones make this area under the curve higher. And so this is where the kind of machine learning approach, or that's why it's called that, because with machine learning, what you do is you actually have systems with lots of different parameters, and you have the computer automatically check lots and lots of different ones and improve this so that you get closer and closer to that upper left point. But for now, you can just tweak and change the parameters yourself manually in order to try to improve this. And so this just kind of gives you, um, I think with a lot of the techniques that you saw um, last week, it feels a bit overwhelming that you have sort of, you know, dozens of different types of filters, dozens of different parameters, particularly with anisotropic diffusion. There's all kinds of things you can tweak and change. And this then fits in quite well because it gives you something you can actually measure. So if you've gone through the effort of making ground truth data, you can now show these curves and try to optimize them and make decisions of you know, anisotropic takes 10 times longer and only gives you a slight improvement, is it really worth doing this step? Or, you know, in this case, difference of Gaussians actually gives us a worse result. Um, so we could clearly go back and try to tweak it so that it gave a better result, but at the moment it gives a worse one, and so we don't include that filter. But that this helps you sort of make those decisions so that you can go through your problem and just try to increase these in order to get a better result. Um, this example doesn't have it very well, but there's often a number of examples you'll have where certain filters will outperform in some areas and then perform much worse in other areas. And so with those, it's then quite difficult to decide you know, which filters you want to use, and you won't be able to use the area as sort of a single metric to quantify because if it's really important that you have great performance up here, then you'll want to use a filter that has the highest value in this range. And if it's really important to have great performance here, then you'll want to filter down here. But that um, in this case, we're quite lucky that all the filters seem to have fairly similar performance so that uh, we don't have to make trade-offs between. And so what we can do is we can just use these curves for sort of um, comparing different systems, and now we have sort of no filter is 0.79, Gaussian filter is 0.9, difference of Gaussians is 0.56, and median filter is 
And so that we see that for this problem, the Gaussian filter works best, and that we can now try changing the parameters of Gaussian and seeing if we can improve 0.9 even more. Um, then there's sort of the slides that I had mentioned before, where, um, you know, how you evaluate models and how you try to understand these curves and optimize these curves and interpret what they mean. Um, and feel free to look into those in sort of relations to other problems outside of imaging where ROC curves are quite important because this is a tool that will sort of come up over and over again, particularly in medicine, this curve um, is very, very commonly used. Um, so if we now kind of switch to another problem uh, that we sort of mentioned at the beginning, we have these problems of sort of multiple phases. So the things that we've covered so far, are there any questions on ROC curves or that approach? Okay, good. Um, so all the problems we've covered so far are simply binary problems where it's saying is this, you know, uh, a mitochondria or background. And so with a lot of problems, we'll end up with multiple different phases where it's not just is this foreground or is this background, but is this clay, rock, or air. And so this example uh, comes from uh, an x-ray measurement where they were looking at sort of shale structure and you end up with sort of an image like this where you have um, rock, sort of this clay material in between, and then air pockets there. Um, I guess you can see it a little bit. Certainly on the slides you can see it much better. And so your problem isn't just a binary classification. There's now three different classes you can fall into. And so the problem here is that sort of when we get to <coughs> thresholding, you know, our decision isn't just where do we put one point, so we have this kind of distribution. Our decision now becomes how do we just sort of find these three different groups in our system. And so we can write out kind of the same simple rule that we did before, where we say, you know, if it's below 0.3, it's void. If it's between 0.3 and 0.5, it's clay. And if it's sort of greater than 0.5, then it's rock. And we can apply that where we have, you know, shale, void, clay, and rock. And that works fairly well. But we see that it's not really a perfect result for this image, that we end up with, you know, quite a few things that are void, that are potentially supposed to be clay, um, a few things that are rock that are probably supposed to be clay as well, and a number of other issues. Why not? The slides get deleted. I think there were a few minor things that were in the lecture last year that somehow got deleted from these slides. This is a mutation. So yeah, you can see the example from last year was image and road lines, and this is obviously not quite as nice of an example. But there you had different performances at different spots. So you had a similar sort of result. Oh, I guess it's not there either. Okay, but that we're basically with these um, with these samples, you have sort of this problem that you need to come up with three different values, and that you can't easily use a tool like an ROC curve to do this anymore. And so what you typically do is you typically try to focus on sort of one sub problem of this where you say, you know, rock versus everything else, or void versus everything else, and then come up with threshold values that make sense for that, and use the ROC curve to focus on just that part of the problem. And so that's usually the sort of point you start off with this, so that you're able to kind of bring it back to a simple binary classification, because trying to come up with these three different values gets very difficult, um, and we'll actually go into this in the advanced lecture a bit more. But it's just that you're aware 
of these problems, that this is sort of not very easy, and that you have this challenge where, you know, even in this curve, it's not clear which point you would pick and why point three sort of cut, serves as that cutoff is very unclear. Um, so for this, we'll leave out most of this. Um, this is just sort of the implementation. Uh, you've seen some of the examples before where applying a threshold is quite easy. Um, you know, in MATLAB or Python, these are sort of exactly the same, that you'll just do sort of greater than threshold or greater than thresh A and probably less than thresh B is what I meant to write here. Uh, so the MATLAB and Python are exactly the same. But in Python, there's a number of different ways to do it. So you can also do it with sort of a map operation by saying for each point in the image, you go through and say it's greater than thresh. Uh, for Java and C++, where you start to get these much more performance systems, you'll have kind of more complicated logic where you have to go through your image kind of one point at a time in order to get that threshold to happen really, really quickly. Um, so for this, it's um, just important to kind of realize the simplicity of using MATLAB and Python, and that as long as you can stay in those tools, your life remains fairly easy, and that as you start to move to Java and C++, everything gets much more difficult and complicated to manage, and that even some simple operation like thresholding can turn into sort of nested for loops with all of your code inside it. Um, so now what we'll go to is morphology, and this is the kind of last bit of tools. Um, did Anders cover any morphology last week? So like erosion, dilation? Not at all. Okay. Um, so these will be sort of the last tools we'll introduce today, where we try to kind of extend the image enhancement a little bit by doing some image enhancement after we've actually done the segmentation. And so what we covered before was image enhancement before we do the segmentation. And so morphology is after. Um, whether makes more sense to do it before or after kind of depends a lot on your problem, but it's just a technique that uh, we can apply. And so kind of like the filtering or image enhancement, what we assume with this is that sort of nearby voxels or pixels in real images are related or strongly correlated with one another, and noise and imaging artifacts are less or ideally not at all spatially correlated. So in the sort of examples from last week where you had like salt and pepper noise, you know, that kind of shows up randomly all over the image, and the structures in your image tend to kind of group together. And so we use spatially correlated to describe this, but basically it's just you know, are your objects larger than one pixel? Because if your objects are larger than one pixel, image enhancement and morphology sort of make sense. And if they're smaller than one pixel or one pixel exactly, then they potentially don't make sense. And so all of these tools sort of assume that groups of pixels tend to belong to objects and single outlier pixels tend to belong sort of to noise. And so when we go back to our simple example before with this uh, uh, mitochondria, we had, you know, these large mitochondria regions and then these small sort of dots or false negatives there. And so what that shows us or what morphology lets us do with this is say that we actually know this is supposed to be one grouped coherent object, and that if there's, you know, single points out here, they're probably noise. And so we can bring that information to our processing step to say that single points should be removed and points that are close together should be connected. And so that's all morphology does with these fairly simple tools of what we'll call sort of erosion, dilation, opening, and closing. And so if we go back to kind of this cross example that we had before, you know, we might have this image of a cross 
for us, particularly because we know it's supposed to be a cross, we can kind of see that it's supposed to look like this, you know, maybe this line down and this line across. You know, we use a simple thresholding on it. You know, maybe we make an ROC curve and we pick the best point, but we still see that, you know, for the computer, this is far away from a cross. You know, there's lots of points it found that it probably shouldn't have, and there's lots of points in the middle that it should have found but didn't. And so this is where, you know, we have a problem of both you know, false negatives and false positives that we're trying to fix. And so what morphology lets us do is say, you know, these things are supposed to be connected together. We'll look at regions and try to combine them. And so the first thing we need to do with this is define what our neighborhood means. And so basically the neighborhood is how many pixels do you assume kind of belong together? And so the kind of smallest neighborhood you could have is, you know, three by three, where you just assume the regions are all connected if they're directly touching the pixels. But you can extend beyond this to sort of much larger definitions of neighborhood, where you have, you know, five by five, ten by ten, or even more extreme cases. And the sort of advantage of having a large neighborhood is that it can sort of smooth out and connect uh, much larger features or much bigger gaps, but it's more computationally intensive and you can get rid of features that are important. A small neighborhood is much faster to perform, but if you have large noise or large holes, it sort of gets limited. And so neighborhood's important for filtering, for morphological operations, um, for component labeling, which we'll get into later, distance maps, even image correlation and tracking methods all have this idea of sort of a structuring element or a neighborhood, um, depending on which tool you're using. And so kind of neighborhood in two dimensions <laughs> is fairly simple, that we can have, you know, a disk of five by five and see we have a sort of circular radius here, a cross, a horizontal line and a vertical line, a star, an octagon, um, and then obviously a completely filled in square. And so each one of these shows us sort of a different neighborhood that could be useful for different problems. And so these are 5x5, five 7x7, by 11x11. Five, seven by seven, 11 by 11. And that this is what we use when we perform erosion or dilation or opening or closing. And so erosion basically says is if any of the voxels in the neighborhood are zero, then that voxel will be set to zero. And it has the effect of kind of peeling a layer off of an object. Dilation does the exact opposite. So if any of the voxels in the neighborhood are one, then the voxel will be set to one. And it has the effect of adding a layer. So sort of like dunking it in chocolate or adding a coat of paint to a car. And so anything that's on the border will be sort of turned on. Um, and for any of you who are familiar with sort of the game of life where you have these little simulations where each pixel looks at its neighborhood and decides if it should turn on or if it should turn off, it's the very, it's a very similar idea to what's going on here. And so if we have sort of erosion and dilation, we can apply this. So if we have an original image, if we provide a dilation, it just makes it thicker so that this pixel turns on, this pixel turns on, this one turns on. For erosion, it's kind of the same. We can take this sort of thick image, and if we erode it, we end up back with our original image that we had before. Um, and so, just thinking about these operations, if you perform a dilation and then an erosion, do you always end up at your original image? I see some heads. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah, so in general, you don't end up back with your original image. This is a very special case where we have this image, we dilate, and then we erode, and we end up with the same thing that we had before. But in general, we don't. And so the problem with you know, using dilation, for example, to fill holes <coughs> is that if you use dilation to fill holes, then your image gets bigger. So if you apply dilation, the side, you know, if you're measuring the radius or the area, the area will always be bigger after dilation. 
in the holes and also outside the holes. And similarly with erosion, if you're trying to strip away or disconnect objects or get rid of noise, if you perform erosion, your image will always get smaller or your area will always get smaller. And so that's why you have these operations that called opening and closing, where they peel a layer off and add a layer on. And so with opening, you know, it's very small objects and connections are deleted. And so you can sort of imagine you're kind of just sort of disconnecting objects, but not making them bigger or smaller. Closing, it's kind of the opposite. So you sort of add a layer and then peel a layer off. And so there, objects that are very close together will be sort of filled in, but objects that are further apart um, will sort of be sort of not, nothing will be done to them because of the erosion and the dilation. <coughs> and so we can take sort of a, a sample image here where we perform sort of dilation and then erosion. And so this is closing. And so we see that this now connects these different points together. We can also then perform erosion and then dilation. And this is then opening. And so the, this disconnects those points, which were only weakly connected before. And as you can see, the sort of edge cases can be sort of problematic. That what do you do here? Because it doesn't really have a neighborhood. You know, it just has one point. Below, left, right doesn't really tell you much about it. And so how you handle that will vary drastically affect what kind of results you get, but that you can see for the same input image, if you were trying to disconnect things, the opening would work quite well, and if you were trying to connect things together, the closing would work quite well. Um, so are there any questions on that? So you can tweak this, um, so all the code is in here and editable. So you can try applying it and changing the neighborhoods and changing the parameters that you use to sort of see what else is happening with these setups. I, yeah? Yeah. So you can never go back to the original image. That's why these tools are used. So that when we look at the opening and closing um, down here example, so in this case we happen to go back to the original image because the original image was very simple. But as the images get more complicated, it can happen, but it's very rare that you'll end up with exactly the same image okay. before as you ended up afterwards. So you can't suddenly swap it back to the object. Right. But that here, you end up with sort of the same volume or same area, but here you have these things connected and here you have them disconnected. So obviously the closing has a slightly higher area here than the opening, but it's not as bad as the dilation or the erosion were. And so the opening and closing are about sort of preserving those parameters a bit. Yeah? Uh, you said something about handling like edge, uh, yeah, the edge of the image in a different way. Yeah. Like uh, what can you, or what, like, uh, what basically the different techniques that have to solve the problem if you don't have an image to connect them? Yeah, so if we, I think we can just run this by itself. I'm not mistaken. Um, so yeah, again, with all the, uh, I think it's like where something from a convolution where you the mirror or exactly. The um, actually, it doesn't say anything here. So actually, in these tools, it looks like you can't. Um, Um, in Nime and most other, 
um, you can choose just like with convolution if you um, so often the default thing is to do sort of zero padding where you have you sort of assume the boundary is zero um, the other options are to assume the boundary is sort of the same as what you had on the inside you can also mirror it um, you can wrap it so you can assume that the left edge of the image once you go beyond that, it's the same information you'd have if you went to the right edge of the image. So for like maps, that can often make sense. Um, or if you're looking at things in like polar coordinates that, you know, going from 0 to 359 is sort of just one step in that direction. And so that you can use mirroring to do that. And I think if we go to, once this loads. And that's something you should tell yourself to work. <coughs> Yeah, and so here we see out of boundaries strategy, and so this is an image J. Um, Scikit image has it as well, um, and that you can click on. I guess this link just opens in here, where you have sort of what strategy do you use when you get to the border of an image. out of bounds. So here we have an example of out of bounds where you can pick the out of bounds strategy. So this is a bit more technical than you need. Um, but yeah, for anything that uses convolutions or uh, sort of filters, you can have a kind of mirroring strategy, a constant value, zero padded, um, any number of other steps, random data. Uh, depending on exactly what result you're trying to get. And so with this, you can either do it yourself. Um, so with tools like NP-PAD, you can pad your images yourself, perform the operation, and then crop them. Or a lot of the tools have this built into them. But if you want to be confident that you know exactly what's happening, it's probably better for you to choose this yourself so that you get the perform you get what you sort of expect. Or what's commonly done is that you sort of take your image and that your end result, you only focus on a small region of it. Um, so that, you know, there's papers where they make, you know, segmentation algorithms and you put in an image that's 512 by 512, but your output image is, you know, 430 by 430. And so you only try to segment things that are sort of in the middle so that you don't end up with artifacts from the edges. But yeah, those are some things that you need to think about when you're doing analysis, is how do you pad and expand your images? And that a lot of times, you know, just padding it with zero makes sense. You know, if it's a microscopy image, that's probably a reasonable expectation. But if you're looking at, you know, even the images we had before, With this mitochondria, for example, you know, this is all the way up to the edge. And so padding it with zero would make the model think this is less likely to be a mitochondria because it has a lot of things around it which aren't mitochondria. And so probably padding it with zero is not the best value, and maybe padding it with the edge values would be. But even padding it with the edge values can be quite problematic. And so I think in the data sets lecture, if I'm not mistaken, one of the data sets we had, you can see that as part of sort of the augmentation, you also have to pick a padding strategy. And that here, I think we padded with the border values. Mm -hmm. And that you can see there, it's now making the wrist longer and straighter than it is. And so if you were building a model or trying to write a tool that found like breaks or unusual things in the bone, the model should find that and say that looks like that's bone that was broken before because bones don't normally bend in the middle at sort of such a sharp angle. And so with something like this, you know, using the edge padding would give you a fairly problematic artifact because there are conditions that present the exact same way as that edge padding. And so you'd probably need a better way to do it and maybe padding it with zeros in this case would be much better than padding it with edges. Um, because we were just looking at age here, having unusual things in the bone isn't a problem, but if you were looking at fracture healing, that would obviously be a huge issue. 
And so it's always something that you kind of need to decide. And I think here we had it with when we showed the, yeah, we have the fill mode for this image data generator and that that has constant nearest reflect wrap as kind of the choices and that you could come up with your own techniques as well if there was one that made more sense for what you were doing. But yeah, it's very much a, an issue you should think about with your data and what approach makes the most sense because it's quite easy to just start applying all of these tools and not really think about you know, does this make sense? And am I introducing new artifacts or new sources of error that might make my result less precise? So yeah, um, I think that covers it. Um, so the lecture, so the exercises for this week, again, are available in nine and six. Uh oh, apparently the link's broken for them. Okay, well, I'll fix the link. I'm not sure why that doesn't work. Um, are available in NIME and um, Kaggle. And then I think the fossil. Um, Segmentation example. It's here. So that should be fixed now. Um, so there's a then video you can watch here if you're interested. a lot of energy. Simply absorbing nutrients through the surface of the body 